Thanks, Cherie. Well, last Sunday we began our journey through the book of Mark here, and uh, we, we made note of the fact that uh, Mark is a man of action, uh, that the word immediately is used uh, profusely throughout uh, this gospel, and things happen rather rapidly. So Mark opens up, unlike the others, uh, which uh, give us a lot of detail, and he simply says this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The first thing he does is he establishes the identity of Jesus. And, and we saw that we, can, we have some synonyms there we can use. He, he can be the Christ, which means Messiah, which means Savior. Okay? So he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is the Savior. And then as we, we read on through our passage last week, we found out uh, a rather odd thing for some of us, that this King, this Messiah, this Savior, actually lowered himself to put himself through something that he had no need to do, to be an example for us. And that, of course, was being baptized. Jesus didn't need to be baptized. Yeah, he was a perfect, sinless uh, man. So we, we ended up by saying that the identity of Jesus is he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is the Savior, but then he is also the ultimate servant. And if you uh, look up the Gospel of Mark and some of the various Bible dictionaries and that, it will often say that he portrays Jesus as a servant. And so it, it really brings into focus all of those different scriptures passages that you know, say things like, if you want to be first, be last. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, become a servant of all. He, he just really sharpens all of those things in our minds. So, as we go on uh, this morning, we, we pick it up. Uh, he has uh, been baptized. He's come up out of the water. And he uh, certainly is uh, elated with what's about to happen to him. He's about uh, to be uh, uh, at a high point in his entire life. We'll see that in a minute. Now, you've all experienced high points in your life, haven't you? Times when it was just really good, and good things were happening, and you look forward to more good things. There's a problem, isn't there? Someone has said, if you're at a point where everything is really good, enjoy it, because it's going to change. And conversely, if you're at a point where it's really low, and we've all been there too, where you just see no hope, you're out in this uh, wilderness, so to speak, and what can we do then? Well, the same guy that said enjoy it while it's good said endure it while it's bad because this too will pass. And it does, doesn't it? Uh, we were over at the, the elder retreat this last week, and, and the speaker was a, a great preacher. And uh, he said this about wilderness experiences, and I, and I thought it was just great, except instead of the word wilderness, he used the term, when we are in trouble. Kind of the same thing. And when we're in trouble, the number one focus we have is to get out of trouble. True, isn't it? When we're in trouble, the, the thing we want the most is to get out of trouble. However, when we're in trouble, what God is interested in the most is what we are going to get out of trouble. You see, we want to get out of trouble. God wants us to get something out of trouble. We don't go through hard times for nothing. It's in the hard times, often the dark corners where we uh, are forced to, to be sometimes, that we truly tune in on God. We truly listen to Him, and He speaks to us. And we, we touched on that last week, didn't we? That the wilderness throughout the Old Testament is the place where God meets with the people He's about to do great things through. So, don't... Uh, maybe don't try so hard to get out of a wilderness experience so quickly. But try very, very, very diligently to ascertain what it is God is trying to teach you through this wilderness experience. 
You know, it's like Paul said in Philippians 4, uh, that he has learned how to be joyful with much or with little, in good times and in bad. And that's what we need to do. So, let's see now what happens to Jesus. We'll pick it up here in verse 12. And I, I've entitled this portion, Ministry Preparation. Because Jesus was baptized, and now he's going to go in to begin his ministry. So he's baptized, he comes up out of the water, and what do we see? We see the heavens open, and we hear the voice of the Father, we see the Holy Spirit descending on him, and the voice of the Father says, Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Wow! What a moment, huh? Can you imagine? I just had, he had to be ecstatic. Here God the Father is saying, this is my beloved Son, and I'm well pleased with Him. Well, if God's well pleased with Him, good things are going to happen, right? Don't we look around at people's lives and at, at churches and things, and, and we say if they're, if they're prospering, in, in our eyes we say, well, God's really blessing them. And if they're struggling, we say, well, they must really be doing something wrong because God's obviously not blessing them. Well, God says, Jesus is perfect, I love him, I'm happy with him, Holy Spirit, drive him out into the wilderness. And that's exactly what happened, isn't it? We, we can read it right here. The Spirit, here's our word, euthus, our Greek word, immediately, so as soon as God finished speaking, I mean, Jesus didn't even get to enjoy the moment. Immediately, the Holy Spirit drives him out into the wilderness. Now, we think that's all bad. I mean, you, in, in our eyes, in our humanity, we would think, well, gee, if God's well priest with him, he ought to give him a party or something, something good, something nice, something warm and fuzzy. And what does God do? He drives him out into the wilderness. And not only that, but he's there for 40 days. Oh, and he's there for 40 days without eating. And Matthew tells us, Matthew gives us a little more de detail. Mark here is just gets on with it. He says, he's in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he's with wild animals and angels are ministering to him. But Matthew gives us a little detail here in Matthew 4, verse 4. And he says that Jesus was there fasting for 40 days. And at the end of that time, Satan came to tempt him. So Satan waited until Jesus is at an all-time low. He's been out there 40 days. There's wild animals out there. The Judean wilderness is a true hell on earth place to be. It's just not good. And so there he is. And he's hungry. 40 days, nothing to eat. He's got to be exhausted. He's out there and the, the sun's beating down on him and it's just not good. And so Satan comes and he goes to tempt him. Now Mark again doesn't give us the details. You can go to Matthew or Luke and, and they'll fill those in for you. But there are three main areas that Satan tempts Jesus. And I think we are all susceptible to those areas. The first place he tempts him is with the physical. You know, and he says, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Okay. While Jesus Christ was fully God, he was also fully human. And he had the same needs and desires that we have. And he was hungry. And Satan says, if, if you're the Son of God, just have something to eat. And what does Jesus do? How does he respond? He says, it is written. He immediately goes to Scripture. Okay. Well, so then Satan moves on and uh, he's going to appeal to his vanity. And he says, well, if you're the son of God, toss yourself off of this pinnacle here and let the angels catch you. If you're so good, show me what you can do. Now, if we're good at something and somebody asks us to demonstrate that, we usually like to do that. You know? And so, if you're, if you're the Christ, prove it. Notice that's kind of the same temptation he faced on the cross. 
if you are the king of the Jews, if you're the son of God, come down off of that cross. Again, Jesus responds, it is written. And finally, he appeals to his ego. And he takes him up on top of the mountain and he says, see all these kingdoms of the world. If you'll come over to my side, I'll give them all to you. And again, Jesus responds the same. It is written. Now, we're all so vulnerable to all of these things. And we're the most vulnerable to these things when we have had a very elevating experience and then we've had it all dashed and we're down here. And there's one more element, and this is, this is so important in your Christian life, and we're alone. When you're alone is when Satan works on your mind. And he does it just like he did with Jesus. He says, if. You remember what he said in the garden? He didn't come to Eve and say, oh, God didn't say that. He came to Eve and he said, did God really say just like he didn't come to Jesus and say, you aren't the Son of God. He says, if you are the Son of God. He plants that little seed in there. And if you're alone, your mind begins to work on that. Stir that around. And it's never good. It always seems to go in a downward spiral. And pretty soon, Satan can wash you clear out of ministry. Because you really aren't any good at it anyway. And you probably shouldn't be doing whatever it is you're doing because you probably aren't qualified. You know, and on and on it goes. So beware when you're at a low and you're alone, you are vulnerable. Now, let's go clear to the other opposite end of that. Jesus was alone, exhausted, tired, in a horrible environment. Satan comes and tempts him. The other end of that spectrum is Adam and Eve. And they're in an absolutely perfect environment, aren't they? They have all they need to eat. Uh, the, the temperature is always right. God himself comes every day and talks with them, speaks with them. Complete opposite of what we saw with Jesus. And yet, we see the same thing happen. Satan shows up. And when he comes to Eve, and he says to her, Has God said? And she eats the apple, we know that, gives it to Adam, he eats the apple, and here we are in the mess we're in today. Yeah. And you can read in Romans, you know, it talks about the Adam of Genesis is the first Adam. Christ is the second Adam. The first Adam failed and fell and he was our representative so we fell with him. The second Adam did not fail. He came, he died, he rose, he passed the test and as our representative his righteousness then is imputed to us. What a deal. That's wonderful because of what Christ did. So here's, here's what I think we need to know is whether we're on a high or on a low, and we all know life's one of these kind of trips. It, it's never like this. We need to know the Word of God. We need to know what God said. And we look here to find that. And we need to have someone or somebody's with us. Now, I understand maybe they can't be physically in our presence all the time, and there are times when we need to be alone too. But in general, we need to have a cadre of close friends, Christian friends, that we can bounce things off of and that can help us get through the hard times. You know, James says in the Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. You see, when you're in the wilderness, it's like you, when you're in the gym lifting weights. It's hard, 
It may even be painful, but you come out stronger than when you went in. Ministry, and we're all called to ministry, right? All of you. Everybody, we should all be in, in ministry. And ministry is simply proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the kingdom. We should all be doing that in some way, shape, or form. Ministry requires preparation. Okay? And testing. And great ministry requires great preparation and testing. So if, if you're going through some hard times, if, if you feel like God's putting you through the ringer, you're out in the wilderness, hang in there. Depend on God's word, depend on God's people, and know that God is preparing you for something, some ministry that you may not have any idea of yet. So the first thing we see after Jesus' baptism is that he goes through a time of preparation. Now after this time of preparation, we see that he begins a ministry of proclamation. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Okay. That's, that's it. That's his ministry in a nutshell. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. There you go. That's all you need to know. And you can share that with people. Well, you know, you put it in your own words because we're all different. We're all going to be talking to different people. So you can you contextualize it you, and that sort of thing. But you, you do it. You tell people about Jesus Christ. The, and the, the kingdom of God is all throughout the scriptures. You know, in the Old Testament, they're looking forward to the time when the kingdom comes. And in the New Testament, we're told that it is here. It's now. Christ is reigning. His kingdom is come. Both Jesus and John the Baptist declare this. So you say, okay... God's kingdom has come. Where is it? Can you show me? It must be here because both John the Baptist and Jesus say it is. Well, if it's here, why then, when the disciples pose the question to, or the request to Jesus, teach us to pray, does Jesus respond, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What? It's here. No, pray that it will come. But you said it was here. Well, now I'm telling you to pray that it will come. What's, what's the deal? Kind of odd, isn't it? Christ's kingdom has come. It's consummated. Christ is sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning from heaven. But it is still to come in the sense that he's not physically present here. He will return and set the kingdom up so that we can see it. But until then, the kingdom is still in operation. And I know that's hard for us to grasp, and a lot of times it's that way in Scripture. And uh, uh, Gerhardus Voss may be of some help to us. He was a, a 20th century uh, theologian at Princeton, taught at Princeton Divinity School. And he coined a phrase called the already, not yet, in trying to explain this. And I think that's about as good an explanation as you're going to get. The kingdom is already here, but not yet here. And so, just go with that. Go with Mr. Voss, Dr. Voss, and you'll be okay. Though it is here, Jesus still has more to divulge to us. It will not be fully realized until he comes. So our ministry should be to declare to the world that it's here. 
The kingdom of God is available to us through Jesus Christ, God's Son. Now, there are many ways to do this. Some of you are probably thinking, well, how can I declare the kingdom of God? Am I going to go stand on the street corner and be like John the Baptist? They behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Probably not, uh, because in our 21st century context, now the Holy Spirit can certainly use those words to bring somebody to their knees, but he doesn't seem to do that very often in our 21st century context. So how can you declare the kingdom of God to this world? Well, you declare it every day in your actions, in your attitudes, in the things that you communicate that you believe. And you look for opportunities to share Christ. You don't have to manufacture them. I believe if we were truly looking, we have a lot more opportunities come and go in our lives than we actually realize to tell somebody about Jesus. When you want to proclaim the kingdom, be bold about it, but don't be pushy. Okay? You, know, you can be bold and, and tell someone about Jesus, and uh, if they're not interested, let it go. Don't be pushy. Nobody has ever pushed anybody into God's kingdom. Nobody has ever argued anyone into belief in Jesus Christ. Okay. So, be bold, but also be intelligent about it. Don't be pushy. There's a time to press ahead, and there's a time to back off a little bit and kind of let it go. We are, uh, in our morning group, we're going uh, through, through Romans... And the book we're using uh, is by R.C. Sproul. And of course, he's a, if you know anything about him, he's a golfer. And so he tells this golf story in there uh, about this uh, professional that was playing with Billy Graham and two other guys. And after he got through with his round, he was so upset that he went over to the, the driving range and he just beaten these balls. And somebody came up and asked him, well, you know, what's wrong? And he said, ah, he says, I don't need Billy Graham shoving religion down my throat. And the guy asked him, he said, he really did that out on the golf course? And the guy stopped for a minute and he said, well, no, he didn't say anything about it. But just being in the presence of Billy Graham, you see. And that's true. People change. And, and I mentioned to the guys, I said, that's true, because when I used to play golf all the time, I made it a point never to tell anybody I was the pastor. And so I'd play with these various guys, and somebody else might tell them or that, or they'd ask you point blank, you know, what do you do? And then I'd tell them. And invariably, as soon as you'd tell them, or they'd find out, they'd say, oh my goodness, I'm... I'm <laughs> if I'd have known you were the pastor, I, I wouldn't have used that kind of language. <laughs> And I would just always respond, well, I wasn't born a pastor. I've heard it all before. It's okay. <laughs> but this guy had a much better response. It was much better. He was, he was telling the story. And he said, when people would, this is R.C. Sproul now. And he says, when people would find out I was a pastor, they'd immediately apologize and that. And Sproul, being much smarter than I am, he would respond, well, you don't have to apologize to me. You ought to apologize to God. He heard every word. <laughs> But you can do things like that, and if you do it with a little humor, you can get away with it. And people will begin to listen over time. So we need to be bold. We need to proclaim the gospel. But we need to do it with a little bit of common sense and maybe a little bit of levity. And by the way, I don't want to miss a chance to point out here, in back there in verse, verse 14, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel. Can you guess what Greek word that is? Sure you can. We talked about it last week. In Romans, they, they translated it preaching. Remember, how can they hear unless they, someone is they, preaching? And the word is keruso. Remember? And it can be translated preaching, proclaiming, just plain old speaking. So he's talking about all of us. We can be doing these things. We don't have to be a, quote, preacher or 
that to do it. So there you go. There's a ministry preparation, ministry proclamation, and now ministry contextualization. Because everything we do takes place in a context, doesn't it? Nothing happens in a vacuum. We've heard that over and over. So what kind of a context is Jesus going to set up for uh, his ministry? Well, let's look here in verse 16. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now we're going to talk more in a couple of weeks about Jesus calling the disciples. We'll get a few details about that. But for now we're still, we're into the big picture. If we're going to be engaged in ministry, and I think we all agree we should be, if we're going to be engaged in ministry like Jesus, it would seem reasonable to conduct our ministries like Jesus. Isn't that doesn't that make sense? If we're going to be in ministry like Jesus, it would be reasonable to conduct our ministries like Jesus did. And how does he do it? Well, the first thing he does is he creates a context of a small group. Now, this is interesting because, again, it's kind of like the baptism. Did Jesus need a small group? I mean, bottom line, he's, he's God. He's sinless, he's perfect. Does he need a small group to keep him mentally sharp? To help him physically get through some things? Of course not. Well, why then does the first thing he does is create this intimate small group of men around him? And it's the first thing he does. He's baptized, he's prepped, he declares his purpose, and be, the first thing he does in carrying out that purpose is start recruiting this group. Ministry, ministry is simply too demanding to do it alone. It's too exhausting to do it alone. And frankly, it's much too important to do it alone. Every time you read of some well-known minister, pastor, evangelist, whatever, falling, I guarantee you it's because he was alone. Now, he may have had people around him. You can be totally surrounded by people and still be totally alone because you don't have to let them in. You know, see? So he may have been, most of these big name guys are surrounded by, you know, tons of people. And yet they're alone because they won't let them in. So Jesus surrounds himself with this group. And he spends the next three years investing his life in them. And they in him. You see? They ate together. They slept together. They went through trials together. They had good times together. And they were bonded. And that's, that's one of the main reasons for the things like the, the elder retreat we went to the first part of this week. And, and by the way, I hope as a church you guys appreciate your elders. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about them. I get a salary. I, I get paid to do this stuff. But they don't. And they spent their own time, even taking time off of work, vacation time. They spent their own money to go over there to try to be better equipped to come back and serve you guys. 
And it was a mar it's a marvelous time because we do the same thing the disciples did. We ate together, we slept together, we played together, we, we uh, worked together, and it's a wonderful, wonderful time. And you cannot go to one of those functions and not come back closer than before you went. And, and I just, I appreciate those guys so much. So, get yourself a small group. Now that small group does not have to be the 6.30 a.m. men's group, or the 6.30 p.m. men's group, or the women's group, or the family Bible study, though it can be. It doesn't have to be. But you do need to develop a few close Christian friends. And, and, and they need to be Christian friends because otherwise you're not going to get Christian advice, you see. And believe me, if you have no need for them yet, you will. I understand that we have God's Word. And we have Jesus Christ, God's Son. And we have the Holy Spirit who indwells us and empowers us. But we still need people. You know, it's, it's the story like the, the little kid, I don't know how old he was, six, seven years old, and... His dad hears him crying in the bedroom, and so his dad goes in there and, What's the matter, Johnny? Well, I'm scared. Well, you don't need to be scared. You understand that Jesus is here, don't you? Yeah, but I'm still scared. Well, why are you scared? He says, Well, I just, I need somebody with skin on. <laughs> And that's the way we are sometimes. Yeah, we, we have Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we need somebody with skin on to hold our hand or to, to give us some advice or whatever it is. We just do. That's the way God made us. We need God's people because as it says in Proverbs, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. And that verse isn't just for men. You could say iron sharpens iron as one person sharpens another. You know, and so that context, you you know, you strike iron against iron, and what do you get? Sparks. Yes. And, you know, so and it's, so sometimes our small group, our our close community of of one or six or whatever it is, need to uh, correct us, and that's never fun for either party. And if you haven't developed a close relationship where you're convinced the person that's attempting to correct you has your best interest at heart and actually loves you as a brother or sister in Christ, it's not going to work. That spark's going to turn into an explosion, probably. <laughs> so develop a close relationship with one or two or three or however many you can, Christians, to help you. We need godly friends who will give us godly advice. Now I understand this takes time. You know, friendships like that just take time. They're not developed in a week or a month. You know, you've got to invest a little time. Now I want you to notice something else that's really strange in this context, in our, our first century context. Who took the initiative? Jesus or the disciples? Well, Jesus. He came upon these guys. They're minding their own business. And he says, hey, you, follow me. Well, Jesus did it backwards. In those days, there was a thing that uh, it called it peripatetic teaching. And it's just peripatetic means Greek word. means wash, walking or walking around. Peripateo, I walk. And so the way it would work is the rabbi or the teacher would have some followers. And he would go around and uh, he would teach them. And they would serve him. But the way you got to be the rabbi's follower was you applied to the rabbi. The rabbi never asked you to come and follow him. Ever. Because he was the big shot. He was the guy that knew. Now Jesus turns the whole system on his head and he says, you come follow me. 
here we have this thing, this theme we see in Scripture with Jesus all the time. The greater serving the lesser. See? The rabbi would never condescend to ask you to follow him. But Jesus does. He takes the initiative. So you say, well, I don't have any circle of Christian friends. Well, take the initiative. Invite one or two people into your life. Yeah. And if they don't want to come, invite somebody else. Yeah. Take the initiative. As I said, over the next three years, they would grow together in a way that would help them to get through what was coming. And now I know what some of you are thinking. You think, yeah, but they didn't do very good at the end. They all abandoned him. Peter denied him. They did. But that was not the norm. That was a moment of weakness in their lives. And you notice Jesus never condemned them for it. So here's what I'd leave you with. We're supposed to proclaim the kingdom. We're supposed to be involved in ministry. But if you want to have Satan get upset with you, start doing some ministry and see what happens. <laughs> it's not a very good recruiting tool here. Because as soon as you start doing some meaningful ministry, you are going to suffer some meaningful opposition. And so you need these things that Jesus is establishing here to help you get through. So are you, just a few questions as we end, are you equipped for ministry? Have you equipped yourself? Have you taken advantage of the tools and things that God has given us? Have you spent time at the Master's feet? Do you know Him? So when you get in a, a crisis situation, you don't have to ask what would Jesus do because you know what Jesus would do. Have you taken an active part in proclaiming the kingdom of God? That's, that's the biggest fault we have in Christianity. We being me too. We don't proclaim the kingdom of God. We don't tell people about Jesus Christ. And finally, do you have a group? Do you have some people in your life? You know, and just a word to the wise. Men, your small group needs to consist of men and ladies with ladies because sometimes the nature of the things are intimate and, and that that we need to discuss and it's just not good to be doing that in a mixed group. So, there you go. Equip yourself. Gather yourself a little group and proclaim the gospel. You might be amazed at what God does. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for our dear friend Mark and the way he so succinctly lays out the things we need to know. And Lord, as we continue through this book, I pray that we will draw closer to you, that we will come out on the other side more like you, more conformed to your image. And you've told us that that's what it's all about. We're predestined to be conformed to your image. And that's the desire of our hearts. And yet, Lord, we are weak and we fail. And yet you're always there to pick us up and move us along. So, oh God, help us to truly focus and love you with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.